It is now time for a question period. Chair of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I guess, uh, Speaker, I'll ask a question to the, the House Leader. Uh, today. I, I will say as I lead off, I want to talk about the fall economic uh, statement next uh, Thursday. I will say the House Leader, I, um, I, I do feel let down. Uh, I guess it's partially my own, my own fault. Uh, when I met with Premier Wynne over a number of bills, including Bill 74, she said she supported it. She did, then she abstained, then she voted against it or fled. So I guess next time I want to cut a deal with the Liberals, I'll just go directly to Pat Dillon and find out how you're going to go. So, as your House Leader, you'll be deciding what legislation comes forward. You'll consult with Pat Dillon and the Working Families Coalition, I guess. Well, let me ask you this. In the fall economic statement, you've been given a heads up. Will we actually see some bold ideas to be spending under control, or are we going to see a lot more liberal fluff? I think it's fluff. Who's going to help me? Who's going to help me? Uh, Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I appreciate the uh, interest the third party now has in what it is that Ontario will be doing going forward for the long term. Our fall economic statement are going to talk about how we're going to continue to invest in our people, what we're going to do to continue investing strategically in infrastructure so that we build and create more jobs. Um, I, I'm hearing the noises from both sides while a question is being put and an answer being put. It stops. Carry on, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, of course, how we're going to continue to maintain a very dynamic business climate to encourage that Remember investment. From Leeds, this is what's work. important for Ontario, not only for Ontario, but for Canada, Mr. Speaker. And we're doing a number of initiatives in this fall economic statement, which I'll address in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. I don't know how to respond. Uh, <laughs> that. We, you know, respectfully, Finance Minister, every day I'm asking you questions or the Premier about jobs and the economy, getting spending under control. I've asked probably a dozen questions about the economic statement. I've not had answers yet, so let me give it a try um, to you. Uh, you know, we just, as I pointed out yesterday, we just passed a four-year anniversary of Ontario's credit downgrade. Next week, we'll hit the fifth anniversary of Ontario becoming a have-not province, all under the McGinty Win Liberals. Uh, we have uh, 300,000 lost manufacturing jobs and almost a million people who want to work who can't in the province of Ontario. And quite frankly, we helped clear the deck so you put a plan forward, but all I've seen since that time, legislation on restaurant menus and 24-7 dispatch for pets when you can't even run the orange air ambulance for human beings in the province of Ontario. Question. So, Minister, with all due respect, enough with the fluff, enough with the clutter, are we actually going to see a plan come Thursday to put Ontario in Thank you. Can you it, please? Can you see it, please? Thank you. Minister? I need to poke. Carry on. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member opposite, uh, the leader of the opposition, smiled and smirked at the hard work that Ontarians have been doing over these last many years, oh. including, Mr. Speaker, the work that we've done on this side of the House without their support. Exactly. That includes reducing spending per capita basis on this side. As a government, we are the lowest cost government anywhere in Canada uh, as a result of the work that we've done. For four years in a row, we've controlled our spending at less than 1% growth year over year. And last year, as audited Remember by the Auditor Canada General, come to our spending actually went down. And that's the first time in over a decade. But apart from all the control measures that we put in place, it's the stimulus and the strategic investments that we're making to support our economy Answer. that has mattered. And that has created more than 475,000 net new jobs since Thank the you. recession, Mr. Speaker. Well, I guess, um, you know, I, I guess Thursday will be a, um, a watershed moment. We'll see if the finance minister acts like a, a finance minister or just a, a parrot for tired old talking points. I mean, truth be told, finance minister, I mean, you can torture statistics uh, and get them to confess to anything, but the reality is there are a lot of people who are out of work in the province of Ontario. There are a lot of people who are losing hope in this great province. And they're losing hope in you because, quite frankly, they don't trust the word you say anymore. That's right. And what's, what's frustrating, too, is why the third Minister party of Transportation MP come to order role to be the defense attorneys for the Liberals as apologists for the Liberals whenever you have to get off the hook. I know why you put the fluff forward, because they'll support it. 
They'll keep this plan going. They'll bail you out no matter what you do. I'm saying is enough is enough. Enough with your fluff. Enough with your baubles and trinkets. I want to see a real plan. I want to see Ontario working again. And if you're not going to do it, we're prepared to do the job for you. Stop, stop, please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. The Minister for Rural Affairs will come to order. Answer, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Talk about fluff. The opposition have no plan, and the only plan that they put forward is one of destruction and is going to harm our economic recovery. The members opposite should stand in this House and support our employer health tax program to help small business. It's being stalled by that side of the House. We need to pass that now to support those small businesses. 60,000 more small businesses would be exempt from paying that tax. They're holding it up, Mr. Speaker. They should be supporting businesses, supporting working, all those families that are working hard. We're taking leadership. We're supporting them by way of and reform. We're introducing new forms of raising capital so when we renew our capital, and our debt, we're doing it at a better rate. Thank They're you. stalling us. They should stand up for Ontario. No question. The member from Nepean and Carlton. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Uh, today, the committee investigating the gas plant scandal was cancelled. The Premier is refusing to be called as a witness to respond to the Auditor General's report. Wow. And as consistently reported by the CP this week, the Premier is holding off-site press conferences during question period so journalists can't cover both. That pattern of behaviour Rebecca, reflects something very seriously wrong with her leadership. It shows she is hiding something. She'd make Rosemary Woods, President Nixon's secretary, blush by her behaviour. Will the minister explain why the premier continues to put obstacles in our place? Why she told the House and committee that the cancellation Question. would only be 33 to 40 million dollars when she knew over two years ago it would be well over 700 million dollars. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, although I'd like the opportunity to answer that question, I'm referring it to the government of the House. Oh, very good. Um, the, the, the convention is simply move it to another minister, and that's all. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member is simply wrong. The Premier has not refused to appear in front of committee. She's indicated to the committee that her office will work with the committee to find a date in the coming weeks. Which, Mr. Speaker, I would remind that when the Leader of the Opposition was called in front of the committee, it took three tries before he went in front of the committee. I would also point out, Mr. Speaker, in terms of if they want to talk about timing, why will they not allow their candidates to come before the committee and to talk about the spending analysis that was done by the Conservative party before it made the very aggressive promise in the last election to cancel these plans, to talk about the type of work that was done by the Conservative Party Answer. and to bring their costs into the table, Mr. Speaker. We've called them over and over again, and they are being blocked by the opposition. Will the member commit today that she will allow Thank the you. candidates to come forward? Supplementary. Yeah, I'm going to go back to the energy minister. I do notice he has a pattern of only answering the last question I have, so I have no opportunity for rebuttal. And I'd really like to go back to him. You have been withholding information. Your premier is hiding from questioning, and you are denying debates in this house. They are not tactics of an honest broker, minister. The premier would not get away with uh, not telling the truth if it were not for the. No, that's not acceptable. Withdraw. Withdrawn, Speaker, but we wouldn't be in this position. Simply a quick withdrawal and then you proceed. Withdrawn, Speaker. So let's review the facts. In the last two weeks, the Deputy Minister of Energy and the head of the OPA told us in the Justice Committee that the government Minister of the, the Environment cost of the come to order. plan exceeded the $40 million the Premier cited repeatedly for over two years. Question. She continued to use that number in the House. Now she refuses to come before us under oath. Will the Minister tell me what the Premier is hiding Thank and you. what is she afraid of? Thank you. Government House Leader. 
The member is simply wrong. The Premier has indicated that she will go before the committee again, and they were working out a schedule, just as the Leader of the Opposition did with the three tries it took for us to get him before it. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? I think we, we understand where the member is coming from. I'd like to quote from a press scrum that she had just this morning when a reporter, from said, Renfrew, a reporter come to order. said to the, the member who's asking the question, again. he said, you've got an AG report on both plants. You've had former Leader McGuinty twice. We've had Premier Premier win there once. We've had Colin Anderson at least twice, maybe three times. I mean, at what point are you going to wrap this up? And the member who just asked the question said, well, when we get the answers that we want. Ah. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> we have been forthcoming. We have brought forward tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of documents. The Premier has stood Answer. in the House day after day and answered the questions. I can't help it if the truth doesn't fit her reality, Mr. Speaker, but the simple fact Thank is you. that we have cooperated Thank in the you. Premier. Thank you. Sup supplementary. So maybe third time's a charm. Back to the energy minister because I won't have an opportunity for a rebuttal. But let's be perfectly clear. The reality of the facts are this. Your government wasted $1 billion. Your leader told us it only cost $40 billion. And then yesterday you had the gall to stand in this house and deny a dying woman the cancer drugs she needs because you're too busy wasting money. And that is not what the priorities of your government are. And if this government's priorities weren't all wrong before, I don't know, Speaker, how much more they could go wrong. So no wonder the pr Premier wants the press gallery off-site during question period. No wonder— Order. She has a right to put the question. Continue, please. No wonder the Premier wants the press gallery off-site no during question period. Here. No wonder she won't appear under oath, and no wonder she cancelled the gas plant investigation for today. Will the government House Leader or the Minister of Energy stand in this place and commit to the people of Ontario that the Premier will testify? Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. That's a new law. April 16th, Mr. Speaker, four opposition candidates invited to testify at the Justice Committee, including PC candidate Jeff Janishek and Zuren Churchin. They all declined. April 30th, the same day the Premier of this province appeared, the Leader of the Opposition is asked to testify. He declines. Backup witnesses Janicek and Churchin also declined. We then invite PC candidate Marianne DeMonte Whalen. She accepts and is scheduled to testify, then mysteriously calls back a few hours later to cancel. May 2nd, Janicek, Churchin, and DeMonte Whalen are called to testify. testify. Janicek tells the clerk to stop calling, and the other two do not respond. May 7th, the Leader of the Opposition is once again invited to testify. He declines, even though he had written a letter to the committee saying that he would try to work for that date. Since he refuses, the Liberals call on Janicek, Churchin, DeMonte, Whalen, and the member from Halton, but none of them agree to testify. Thank May 23rd, Janicek, Churchin, and DeMonte. Thank you. All refuse to testify. That's it. I'll, I'll take care of that part of it. New question. The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. Ontario households and businesses are paying the highest electricity prices in Canada, and they're tired of being kept in the dark about electricity decisions. We've been pushing to get some answers, but despite promises of transparency and openness by this government, we're not getting them. I'll start with a simple question. The Premier was not available to take questions at today's hearings on the cancelled gas plants. When will she be available, or is she refusing to attend? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we've been very clear that the uh, the Premier, who has appeared in front of the committee before, who has asked over 200 questions in this House, has indicated her willingness to appear in front of the committee, and her office is working with the clerk of the committee to find a date. 
Mr. Speaker, again, when we invited the Leader of the Opposition to appear in front of the committee, it took several tries before he would agree. We've asked the member of Halton to appear in front of the committee. He's refused. We've asked Conservative candidates to appear in front of the committee. They've refused. Mr. Speaker, we have been forthcoming. It was this Premier who asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville situation. It was this Premier who asked me as House Leader to work to set up the committee with a broad scope and broad powers to undertake the examination that's going on. As I think I mentioned uh, uh, already, she's answered over 200 Answer. questions in this legislature, and she will be forthcoming uh, in front of the committee in, in, in the near future when a date can be arranged with Thank her you. office. Supplementary. Well, that wasn't the straightest answer I've ever gotten. <laughs> Speaker, people hear the government talk about transparency and openness, but they see the Premier scrambling to avoid testifying in her role in the cancellation of private power plants and refusing to let the auditor look at the $180 million or more that they spent on nuclear plans that aren't going ahead. People paying the bills think they deserve some answers. So I'll try an easier question. The minister insists that he's moving ahead with plans to refurbish nuclear plants. In fact, the government's already signed contracts worth nearly a billion dollars. Has the minister done any cost-benefit analysis? And if so, will he table that analysis today? Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there were several uh, issues raised in, uh, in the question, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, answer the question by asking a question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the uh, New Democratic Party, both on transit and on uh, energy issues, Mr. Speaker, have no program. They have no policy. They stand up and ask questions. They are not accountable to their own base. They're not accountable to the public in Ontario. They have no answers for energy. They have no answers for transit, Mr. Speaker. I would like the critic Those who is order. responsible for creating alternative policy to the government to come forward Remember from the Kitchener, water energy, come to and order. transit and transportation to make sense. Thank you. Final supplementary. So I, I take that as a no. Uh, speaker, again to the Minister of Energy, households and businesses are paying the highest electricity bills in the country, and they see a Premier refusing to answer basic questions about a billion dollars handed to private power interests for gas plants that won't be built. A government that refuses to answer questions about hundreds of millions spent on abandoned nuclear plants and a minister who is signing nuclear power contracts worth hundreds of millions but can't produce a business case to justify the expenditure. Does the minister think that's acceptable to people who are paying more and more? Mr. Speaker, the questions have been asked on a number of occasions, and they've been answered, Mr. Speaker, and I'll answer them again. Expenditures to date on nuclear refurbishment are for definition phase activities, such as the establishment of project organization, scope finalization, engineering, planning, procurement, and contracting. In fact, uh, the, the project itself uh, is going to create 25,000 jobs wow. for the province of Ontario, Mr. Oh, Speaker, yeah. particularly here in the GTA. Energy Mr. Workers. Speaker, uh, we also have an independent oversight advisor who will provide regular updates on the progress of the Darlington nuclear refurbishing project uh, to the Ministry of Energy. Mr. Speaker, we are moving forward Energy responsibly. We are moving forward Answer. on the basis of not building new nuclear at the, uh, in the foreseeable future, Mr. Speaker, a decision which that critic has agreed with. He said yes to no new Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. Somebody should tell him not to point all the time. It's not polite. My question is to the acting premier. <laughs> People are concerned about the cost of everyday life. Families across Ontario haven't seen a real raise in years. The cost of everyday life is going up, and instead of making life more affordable, your government is letting people fall further and further behind. New Democrats and Andrea Horvath have worked hard to deliver results that will make life affordable so that people can stop treading water and start getting ahead, like people getting a 15 per cent reduction in their auto insurance rate. Can the Acting Premier tell us why people's auto insurance rates are still going up? Acting Premier. 
Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm pleased to say uh, that as a result of the hard work that this side of the House has been doing, we've been fighting to reduce the cost of claims, trying to ensure that uh, the, uh, the, the degree of fraud and other circumstances that are creating those premiums to have gone up over these past number of years, that we start to get them going down. And as a result of the legislation that we've passed, with your support, and I appreciate the work of the third party in these endeavors, but I am pleased that rates have, in fact, on average, been reduced to a point. We are anticipating greater reductions in the next release in January as a result of the work that we've done to give Fisco more control, more teeth, and more oversight. And as a result of those initiatives, we are confident that that work will enable us to have better premiums overall. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, I'm going to quote my good friend, the member from Trinity Spadina, and say drivers are being whacked. We're seeing people's insurance rates go up. We have an email from William who says his auto insurance in Durham has gone up 16 percent. Lena from Hamilton writes in and says her auto insurance has gone to 11 percent. So as people are getting squeezed, they're falling further and further behind. And many of these same drivers are seeing their auto insurance going up, are getting hit when it comes to the Drive Clean program, having to pay twice for tests that they've actually passed, but the machinery says that they failed. So I ask you, can the acting premier explain to me and to those people why people are falling further behind under this government's watch? So, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I would, I, I'll give uh, the public who may be watching to call this hotline if they wish to issue a complaint a to Fisco. It's 1-855-584-7669. Now, you can call that number, you call the Obensman to, to, to create or at least explain some of the difficulties you may be arising. But I can say this. Rates for the third quarter in a row have been, have been dropping on average. I, have, I can cite issues where people have actually re received more than 15 percent reductions on their renewals as a result of making those calls and shopping around. So I encourage people to do just that. We are fighting fraud. We're looking at the, the, what happens with regards to uh, the tow trucks, the collision repairs, the health clinics. We're providing greater rates for safe drivers. Yes, We're implementing new dispute resolution reviews. All of these and the watchdogs that's going to be implemented will enable us to champion and Thank fight you. on behalf of our consumers. Mr. Yes, Speaker. Yes. Final supplementary. To the acting premier, it's clear that people back home are feeling squeezed. And what's clear is it would appear that this government is dragging its feet when it comes to dealing with auto insurance rates going down or dealing with the drive clean program. People under drive clean are having to pay more than they should in order to make sure that they meet the standards. Why? Because the program doesn't work effectively as they're failing even though their cars are safe because of the equipment. So I say to you, whether it's big costs like auto insurance or lots of smaller costs like multiple drive clean tests for cars that aren't big polluters, people are feeling like they're falling further and further behind. Why is the Premier and the Acting Premier letting people fall further and further behind in this province? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, um, this side of the House has been fighting hard to find jobs and create stimulus so those people could be working. And that's the issue. There is a lot of concern still as a result of our global recession that ex continues to exist. But here in Ontario, our fundamentals are strong. People are working, and there is greater confidence in where we're going. We're fighting auto insurance rates. We're doing everything necessary to protect individuals with their pensions, Mr. Speaker. No one on that side of the House is even looking forward. We're doing that here. We'll continue to fight for the people of Ontario. Thank you. New question? The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Speaker, uh, following the Premier's announcement last week of a new era of uh, transparency for her government, I asked her to table the Metrolinx Bombardier $770 million contract. Speaker, that's a contract that was sole source, is costing taxpayers millions in penalties today, and is another indication of the mismanagement of her government. I received a letter this morning from Metrolinx. And not surprisingly, this letter confirms that the government will be dealing Order. with this document in the same way that it dealt with the gas plant documents. From, from Mr. Bruce McQuaig, we're working on it, 
but parts of the contract may be redacted. Why is that not surprising? I'm going to ask the minister to ensure that we get that contract into our hands, unredacted, Thank you. and that we know what the story is. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I'm getting to feel a great, great amount of empathy for the, for the, uh, for the member from Newmarket Aurora. He just seems to have trouble getting any position of which the facts will support. First, he was proffering, Mr. Speaker, that there was a $70 million penalty. Bombardier told him it wasn't true. Metrolinx told him it wasn't true. I told him it wasn't true, but he keeps on repeating it. So let me say again, it's not true. The contract is proceeding. This is a party that seems to have something against not just public transit, but Bombardier, Mr. Speaker. They want to cancel all the projects, freeze go, cancel LRT. That would destroy Bombardier, Mr. Speaker. He does it. I have never seen a Conservative Party tack business the way they did. Bombardier provides excellent service, gives us great value, Mr. Speaker. The Premier and the Minister of Training College and University were out doing a partnership with Centennial College, Mr. Speaker, to increase, to, to increase job creation. Bombardier is one of our biggest employers and fastest Thank growing you. companies. It'd be a time. Thank you. So please, supplementary. Speaker, I have no problem with Bombardier. It's the government that's bungling millions and millions of dollars through contracts that are, that are, quite frankly, a bungling on his part. Why doesn't, the, why doesn't the minister know what is in this contract? The fact of the matter is I now have a letter from Metrolinx that insists that the contract I referred to was, in fact, competitively bid. That is patently false. It is not true. This was an option under a contract that was signed a year before under which that contract gave Metrolinx an option. That option should never have been taken out. That option should have been publicly bid and saved the taxpayers some $200 million. I want to say to the minister now, get your facts straight, bring that contract forward, let us all see what the facts are, and then we'll draw the conclusion about who has this wrong. Will the minister agree to get that contract into this house unredacted so we know what they did? Yeah. Yeah. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, uh, with uh, for uh, if business has uh, friends like that, they don't need enemies, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is a party that wants to cancel almost every major rapid transit project in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Th that, would, that would, first of all, cost billions of dollars uh, to that company. It would cost billions of dollars in cancelled projects. This is the party that thinks they can buy gas plants for free at garage sales, Mr. Speaker. I guess that's where they want to buy their transit projects. They don't seem to understand that infrastructure costs money, Mr. Speaker. They don't have any plan to pay for it, but they want to cancel it. The contracts, Mr. Speaker, negotiated between Metrolinx and Bombardier are quite transparent. As the City Council and Commissioner Waterloo said to the member from Kitchener-Stoga, you're dead wrong. I have to agree with the Council in Kitchener. My dear friend from Market Aurora is just simply Thank wrong, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Trinity Spadina. My question is to the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs. Last week, you announced a land use planning review that specifically excludes OMB operations. This is not what communities were asking for, and this is not what you promised two months ago. It's another bait-and-switch, just like Bill 26 and 204, which was supposed to make OMB decisions consistent with provincial policy, and just like Bill 51 and 207, which the government said would, quote, make municipal councils the decision-makers with respect to planning, unquote, Despite these bills, the OMB remains out of control. Earlier this year, the OMB ignored Waterloo's reg region's official plan and defied the province's own Places to Grow Act. When will the government finally reform Question. the undemocratic and out-of-control OMB? Thank you. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate the member's passion on this issue. We've uh, spoken about this many times, and I think that certainly at the, at the province, this government believes that we have a strong and modern land use planning system, and we believe we have a well-established uh, development charges system, which is what I announced uh, just last week. And we heard from many municipalities, community groups, and developers who want more accountability, more transparency in the system. We believe it's time for a refresh, and certainly we believe that good land use planning is important to ensuring the long-term prosperity of our of our province for our environmental health and the social well-being of Ontarians and uh, when I spoke about the land use uh, planning uh, announcement last week uh, we talked about uh, including the OMB and development charges to better need, meet the need of 434 Answer. municipalities across Ontario. We need to hear the views of everyone. He knows. And certainly we have conflicting views, and I look forward to any input that the member makes uh, going forward, and I look forward to the supplementary. Here. Thank you. Supplementary. In 2011, the Minister of Labour promised the people of Ottawa that if re-elected, he would reform the OMB. He was re-elected and nothing happened. In 2012, the Minister of Finance promised the people of Mississauga that he would rein in the OMB in months, not years, he said. It's been over one year and nothing has happened. Instead, we have a bait-and-switch government review that focuses more on the needs of developers than the needs of communities and municipal planners. When will the government stop making false promises and admit it has no intention of ever reforming the OMB. Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, I don't share the uh, the negative perception that the member has, and certainly I, I understand that everybody has concerns, and certainly the member from Ottawa and uh, many of my colleagues on both sides of of the house have expressed concerns about how we can improve the system. We have a very short scoped period of time before the end of the year. I'm hoping to hear from developers, from municipalities from community groups. I think we certainly want a more accountable and transparent system, and we, and we believe it's important to find a balance be, with, the, with all of land use planning across Ontario. Uh, everyone has a stake in making planning work across Ontario, whether it's community groups, whether it's municipalities. He knows. Uh, from the building and development industry, I've heard from them that we want to put in changes that will implement predictability, transparency, cost-effectiveness for communities Answer. and for businesses across Ontario, because uh, these moves will there attract and retain business on There's Ontario. There's your answer. I thank you. Thank you. Any question? The member from Glengarry, Prescott, Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the job-creating Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. The member will use the title or the writing only. Withdraw. <laughs> I agree. The member should withdraw. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Our government's economic plan, investing in people, investing in infrastructure, and creating the right business climate for job creation in Ontario is something we are prioritizing. We can't do this unless we help the small businesses and the people they employ across the province. On Wednesday, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, a body which represents over 42,000 small businesses across Ontario, released an open letter. It was addressed to the minister and also to the Minister of Finance, requesting that this House pass Bill 105, the Supporting Small Business Act, and proceed with the next stage of the legislative process. Could the Minister please inform the House, along with the members of the CFIB, why this bill has not moved to committee yet, even though it has been debated for 15 and a half long Thank hours? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great question, and yes, small businesses are an integral part of Ontario's economy. And Bill 105 will help to support small business in Ontario and ensure that 60,000 small businesses will pay less employer health tax. And in fact, it'll eliminate that tax altogether for 12,000 small businesses in this province. This legislation is exactly what we need to help drive the economy forward and help small businesses and support the creation of new jobs. Now, the PCs have stood up in this House time and time again to ask us where our plan is. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is part of our plan. And, but members of the official opposition continue to denigrate the hard work that Ontarians do for this province and do for Ontario's economy. 
42,000 small businesses have voiced their opinion, and we're trying to do something good here for the small businesses of Ontario. The fact that this bill has not moved forward to committee, despite over 15 hours of Answer. debate, is disappointing, to say the least, Mr. Speaker. I urge all members of this House to work together, heed the calls from CFIB, Thank and you. do the right thing and push this bill. Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Um, Weaving in and out of government policy is one thing, but I want to re remind both the questioner and the answer to stay on government policy. Please carry on. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for the update. It's disappointing to hear that we're unable to find some common ground on doing the right thing for the economy and also for uh, the right thing for our small businesses in Ontario. We received another letter on this issue from Tanner Financial, a small business located here in Ontario, and it stated, and I quote, our firm provides benefits to financial planning to small and medium-sized businesses in Ontario. We have found that many of our smaller clients are still in a stage of growth where any tax is prohibitive to their success. It goes on to say, Speaker, increasing the exemption by any amount will have a positive impact. The letter goes on to urge this House to work together and pass this important bill. Can the Minister please inform the members of this House how this might implicate implicate small businesses like Tanner Financial and small business owners uh, who run them. Stim this House cannot work together to pass this important bill. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member for his question. Mr. Member Speaker, from Prince Edward Hastings roughly, will come to order. There are roughly 400,000 medium-sized firms, small and medium-sized firms in Ontario, and this figure represents 99 percent of all businesses operating in this province, and it's obviously a significant source of employment. So by providing the right kind of support that small businesses need, Bill 105, the Supporting Small Businesses Act, can play a very strong role in the economy, and that's exactly the work that all of us need to do as elected members of this House. This government's priority is to create good jobs and grow our economy, and we're doing this by investing in people, investing in infrastructure, and creating a dynamic and innovative climate for businesses to succeed. Bill 105 will do this, Mr. Speaker, and by not supporting this important legislation, Answer. we're not supporting organizations like the CFIB and Tanner Financial. Ultimately, we're not supporting a growing business environment in Ontario, which is good for the Thank economy you. and an integral part of creating good, meaningful jobs. Thank you. New question. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, speaker, my question is to the Minister of the Environment. Minister, the Supreme Court has ruled that profits made off of revenue-neutral programs are illegal and must be paid back. Yet you continue to flout the law in order to keep collecting multi-million dollar surpluses every year using the Drive Clean program. In Tax fact, grab. in just two years, the Liberals have collected an additional $30 million using their illegal Drive Clean tax grab. How they wasted that. Minister, it's time to show some respect for the law. So will you comply with the Supreme Court's ruling today by ending this abuse of Ontarians' hard-earned money and by paying back all of the revenue you've collected in your illegal drive it's clean illegal. tax credit. It's illegal. Pay back. Minister of the Environment. Well, here we are again with the Conservative Party attacking a program which is designed to improve air. Uh, I, I guess you might not be getting the message. Minister of the Environment, please be seated. The member from Renfrew will come to order. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. And the member from Halton will come to order. That's enough. Carry on. The member will be aware that for the first decade, this program was actually in deficit. In other words, it was costing money to provide this program, which was established by the Conservative government a number of years ago in 1999. I want to tell him, and this may surprise, this may surprise some of the new members uh, in the Conservative Party, but in fact the only increase in price that has come for the Drive Clean program was implemented in 2002 by the Conservative government, oh. Mike Harris. You asked, you're going to get it. The, minister from, the member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. Finish your answer. A 10 second wrap up. There are some members sitting on the benches, were, including your leader, were part. So that's the only increase that we have seen. I am working at the present time. Thank you. The minister of Finance. Thank you. Supplementary. Yeah, Minister, now that your uh, government is uh, getting advice from former PC Environment Minister Norm <laughs> Sterling, I'm wondering if you're going to be taking his advice. On drive clean, 
From your conversations with him, you clearly know that a progressive Conservative government would have phased this temporary program out long ago. That's why we've been calling on the Liberal government to scrap the program for years. Now, I'm sure you've watched CTV so no. News and saw Mr. Sterling recommend it's time to sit down, work together, and phase out drive clean. So, Minister, will you accept Mr. Sterling's advice and start working with us to scrap drive clean once and for all? Well, it, it's, it's, inter it's interesting that you would, in fact, ask me to accept the advice of a member of your party who was thrown under the bus. Right. It was denied the nomination. There's no point of order right now. But stop the clock, please. If you would take my advice, maybe we would be able to make sure that these things didn't happen because I didn't hear it because I was dealing with somebody heckling over here. And if you need to withdraw, I would ask you to withdraw. Well, if it would, uh, I will withdraw, of course. Uh, but here we go again with, with the Tories. Their inexplicable war on clean air. I know. What is it? They won't be happy until they stoke up the coal plants again, including the, the Nanticoke plant. <coughs> it appears they want to rev those up He's again. The Answer. They want to put some 36,000 tons of smog pollutants in the air we breathe by replacing drive clean with their drive dirty program and ultimately Thank you can say this is what Thank you. Your question. The, man, the member from Tomiskamy Cochrane. Thank you speaker. My question is to the acting premier. Last year the government cut the MNR program for the tra live trapping and relocation of nuisance bears and since then there have been several near fatal bear attacks across the province. The last one in Peterborough. In parts of my riding, human bear encounters are a daily occurrence, further increasing the risk of attack. This afternoon, your government will have the chance to support my motion to create a special committee to develop a provincial bear management strategy. Will you? The, to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to respond. Uh, um, I think what we can say, uh, Mr. Speaker, is that our government certainly supports the spirit of the uh, motion that's coming forward. We are always uh, interested in having further discussions about important matters such as the one that will be coming forward this afternoon. And I hope that I know the member, I think, understands that uh, the Minister of Natural Resources uh, uh, treats this as a very serious issue as well. We, we maintain that public safety is the number one priority, particularly as it relates to the, uh, uh, the issue of human bear conflicts. Uh, uh, the Minister is looking at instances of human bear conflicts across the province, looking at available options to address the issue and uh, evaluating some of the wildlife management options. I think it's also important, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the member opposite and certainly our members here acknowledge the, uh, yes, the time from the member for Thunder Bay Atacoka. He's yes, brought forward a private member of the bill as well, which recognizes the challenge that's before us. So certainly we thank you for that. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Once again, uh, to the Acting Premier. In response to my question on October 3rd, regarding the Liberal, Liberal government's cuts to the bear management program, the MNR minister stated, and I quote, this is an issue that we take very seriously and we are developing a plan, Whoa. end quote. Don't you think it's about time that you consulted with the people who actually deal with bears on a daily basis, the people who actually live in bear country? This, all per, all, this special committee will travel throughout the province and actually consult with them. Once again, once again, will your government support my motion to create an all-party committee to actually address the bear management issue in this province? Well, well, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, indeed, uh, and when the when the minister uh, addressed that issue and said they're looking at a plan, that's indeed the case. I mean, he understands very much how this is a, a very significant issue. It's a public safety issue, and indeed, the uh, wildlife uh, management options are being explored. Again, our colleague from Thunder Bay, Atacoka, has a private member's bill that's also going to be coming before the House, and I think it's it's important to uh, to accept that his real leadership being shown by him as well. And and again, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
uh, the spirit of the motion is one that we uh, uh, that we welcome. And uh, uh, further discussion with Northerners is always welcome. But again, the Minister of Natural Resources is taking this very seriously, evaluating various options, and we want to continue to work with yes, the member opposite and all other members in the House to find some solution to this challenge. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister, each summer I attend musical, artistic and cultural festivals in western Mississauga. I watch our artists and our performers just pour their hearts out into their music and into their choreography, and I appreciate that the musical community in our province of Ontario is passionate about its work. Earlier this year, you and the Minister of Finance announced the Ontario Music Fund, which focuses on stimulating economic growth, raising the global profile and building a dynamic market for our music companies and performing artists. Much anticipated in the arts community, the Ontario Music Fund was officially launched earlier this week. Would the minister please explain to the House some of the highlights of the Ontario Music Fund? The minister of Culture, Tourism and thank Sport. You, thank you, Speaker, and thank, I want to thank the member from Mississauga, Chris Bill, for asking that wonderful question. Speaker, I say wonderful because the Ontario Music Fund is really a wonderful program. It is a program that contributes 45 million commitment we make in the 2013 budget and contribute 15 million over three years to capitalize on the success of our music industry and accelerate Ontario's economic growth. The OMF will support sound recording in Ontario, marketing and promotion of Canadian artists, live performances both in Ontario and abroad and business development initiatives. This will be accomplished through four streams, music company development, music industry development, music futures, and Answer. live music. Speaker, the music company development and music industry development stream will launch October the 28th. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister Ontario is English Canada's cultural and artistic hub. And like any type of business, the arts community needs a state-of-the-art infrastructure. We have the creative and performing talent, and Ontario's music industry also needs the tools and facilities to succeed in today's dynamic and rapidly changing music industry. Ontario's musicians of tomorrow, bands like Nigel and the Senators, need to know how to get their music produced, the promoted and protected. <laughs> Mississauga's local studios like Metalworks and Sonic Sound need to connect the best musical talent with both world markets and local gigs. Minister, please explain how this funding benefits Ontario's music industry. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much for the question again, Speaker. Ontario's vibrant and diverse music industry is a vital contributor to the province's cultural and economic prosperity. In 2011, Ontario's music sector generates over 429 million in revenues, accounting for almost 82 per cent of Canada's total revenues. Our province is home to Canada's largest and one of the world's most diversified music sector. The new Ontario Music Fund represents a significant commitment by Ontario to strengthen our music industry. Answer. This is why we created a new Ontario Music Fund as part of the 2013 Ontario Budget. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from York Simple. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Finance. Tomorrow, November the 1st, is the start of Financial Planning Awareness Month. And also, tomorrow, you will meet other provincial finance ministers to discuss enhancing the CPP. Our employees and employers cannot afford any more mandatory deductions that an enhanced CPP or new OPP would entail. They're already having trouble making ends meet. Why then, Minister, are you failing Ontarians by not allowing PRPPs, pooled registered pension plans? You adopted our PRP plan into your 2013 budget. Why are you stalling? Instead of a new Ontario pension plan, why don't you allow PRPPs for Ontarians to save by themselves Question. for themselves with lower costs and greater flexibility? Or don't you trust Ontarian workers with their own money? Thank you. Sir Finance. 
Well, there you have it, Mr. Speaker. That side of the House feels it's not important to support the families of Ontario by suggesting that we not give them other opportunities. We are introducing PRPPs, a voluntary program. We said we would, and we're proceeding to do that. That's not in question. The point being made, though, is they feel middle-class families can live on $12,000 a year when they retire. If we don't accept that at this side of the House, we're going to work and champion the cause for them in the years to come. Minister, I'm concerned with your inaction on improving the retirement security of Ontarians. In 2016, there will be more people drawing from a public sector pension than paying into one. This is leading to $100 billion in unfunded liabilities. People are living longer, and the return on retirement investments has never been lower. As the tsunami of retirees appear on the Ontario Hydro horizon, we need to deal with the reform of the public pension system. Minister, what is your government doing to reduce the over $100 billion of unfunded liabilities within the public sector? Thank you. Minister of Finance. So, listen, I, I appreciate that I think all of us in this House, I'm not trying to be cute here, I think we all share the concern that the people of Ontario deserve to retire with some decency and with security and with a degree of comfort knowing that when they do retire, all the hard work and, and the investments they made will pay off. The member opposite has been doing some work to that effect with voluntary pool for retirement pension plans. We are proceeding with that. It's a voluntary program. We're going to provide more choice. And there are a lot of Ontarians that do have flexibility, but we know more than 50 to 60 percent do not. And it's those that we're trying to protect. It's those middle class earners, especially, that need support. And I look to that side of the House to recognize that, to yes, accept that we need to work with all of the provinces across Canada. That's what I'll be doing tomorrow with my colleagues so that we can Thank propose you. and, and encourage. Your question, member from Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Speaker, as the minister knows, Windsor hospitals are being threatened with the loss of funding for all cancer surgeries if they do not comply with a Cancer Care Ontario directive to transfer thoracic surgeries to London by December the 1st. My question is simple. Is the minister going to allow this dispute to escalate to the point where Windsor patients lose access to vital cancer surgery? Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, what I can say uh, is that uh, I am absolutely committed that Windsor area patients receive the highest possible quality yeah. cancer care. Uh, speaker, I rely on the advice of uh, experts, including experts at Cancer Care Ontario, to ensure that all Ontario patients, including those in Windsor, get the highest quality care, and they are doing a great job, Speaker. In fact, Ontario cancer patients have among the best survival rates in the world. As part of their work, Cancer Care Ontario has implemented the thoracic surgical oncology standards that are evidence-based. Uh, within those standard, standards, CCO has set out that hospitals need to meet a minimum volume of surgeries in order to be designated a thoracic centre. Yes, uh, speaker, that minimum requirement is 50 in tw in, uh, uh, 150. In 2012-13, there were 49 Thank you. Sur surgeries performed. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the question is about access to care in our communities, in Windsor, and apparently uh, the Minister's version of the map of Ontario really does end in London. Speaker, I understand that the dispute between Cancer Care Ontario and Windsor Hospitals has been occurring for the better part of six months, and yet the minister has really done nothing. Windsor Hospitals are also concerned that the loss of thoracic surgeries will have a long list of detrimental effects and impacts on their patients. And now patients fear that the loss of all cancer surgeries in their region, and they're wondering who is going to stand and protect their access to health care. Can the minister explain how she's going to solve this problem and so that cancer services in Windsor are preserved? Uh, 
Speaker, I can assure the member opposite and the member, member from uh, Windsor uh, West that uh, that Windsor patients will still receive, will continue to receive cancer surgery, uh, a cancer care. Speaker in Windsor, uh, Speaker, Cancer Care Ontario's work. Uh, as a result of their work, the 30-day post-op mortality rate for the removal of a lung speaker has been cut in half. Let me repeat that. The mortality rate has been cut in half thanks to Cancer Care Ontario's focus on improving quality of care. I have been working very hard, Speaker, with the member from Windsor West on this issue. We continue to work to ensure that, can that uh, Windsor area patients continue to receive the highest quality Answer. care. Answer. Thank Bravo. you. New question. The member from Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. I've got a question this morning for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Wow. Speaker, in my role as parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, I've engaged in a number of important discussions with municipal partners across the province. In particular, at the AMO conference last August, I joined with the Minister of Northern Development and Mines, as well as uh, a number of other ministers from our government, for a meeting with the Northern Ontario Large Urban Mayors. Speaker, at this meeting, the Northern Mayor shared with our government key priorities and how we can advance the growth plan for Northern Ontario. So, Speaker, will the Minister of Northern Development and Mines please provide the House with an update on how our government is working to address those priorities that were outlined by the Northern Mayors? Thank you, Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to have an opportunity to, uh, to address this question today. Uh, I want to let the members of the legislature know uh, that yesterday we reached out to the Northern uh, Ontario Large Urban Mayors and a number of other Northern Municipal Leaders to share the very exciting news that the province will be hosting a Northern Leaders Forum on December the 6th, uh, 2013, in the beautiful uh, community, Northern community of Timmins. Um, this forum is going to be bringing together uh, municipal, Aboriginal and community leaders as well as a uh, number of our government ministers to work to identify our opportunities to advance the uh, objectives of the Northern Ontario uh, Growth Plan. And speaker, we understand how important it is to work with our partners to, to build on the competitive advantages of Northern Ontario. Yes, sir. Part of our government's plan to support a dynamic and innovative business climate that attracts investment and continues to create jobs. We're very excited about the Thank Northern you. Leaders Forum. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, thank you, Minister. Speaker, this forum is a key priority that the Northern Mayors were advocating for, something I know they're going to be very pleased to hear is taking place and in the next few weeks. Under the leadership of our Premier, regional collaboration between municipalities has been welcomed and encouraged to ensure that we benefit the people of Ontario to the greatest possible manner. Speaker, it's also great to hear the Minister of Northern Development and Mines speaking positively about the advancing the growth plan for Northern Ontario. Through initiatives such as the recent program changes, and this Northern Leaders Forum. Will the minister now please share with the House how the Northern Leaders Forum is going to help advance the actual implementation of the growth plan for Northern Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And certainly, I am um, one of the requests at the meeting we had with AMO was to uh, to have a Northern Leaders Forum, such as we're in, I'm announcing today. And very pleased that our government is able to fulfil the uh, request of the NOLA mayors. Uh, our government has always placed an extremely high priority on working with our partners across the north, and that's only been more emphasized uh, under Premier Wynne's leadership. Uh, our government first released the growth plan as a blueprint for, uh, for job creation and economic development over the next 25 years throughout the north. And Since its release a couple of years ago, we have seen communities, organizations, uh, um, uh, businesses and Aboriginal uh, groups achieved some amazing things that have unequivocally shown to me and proven my belief, Speaker, in the strength and the resilience that we all share as Northerners. Speaker, this forum is going to provide a, a great opportunity for our government and our Northern partners to renew Sir? momentum and drive forward the next phase of the growth plan. Thank you, Mr. Question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the uh, Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, snowmobile clubs in my riding and across Ontario have come to us in distress. They've been told by Hydro One and the orders of your ministry that effective January 1, 2014, they will no longer have access to the use of hydro corridors unless the local municipalities enter into agreements to not only fund 50 per cent of the total cost of taxes on the land, but also ensure that all trails are moved 15 metres away from any tower, that fencing and gates are installed, and that the areas are monitored year-round. Minister, there's a few problems with this. 
The Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs tells us it's impossible to move the trails 15 metres away from any tower. Second, they question why they should have to maintain the trails year-round when they are multi-use trails. Other people use these trails outside of snowmobile season. And third, how much is this going to cost and impact the industry? Minister, these are valid concerns. Can you please explain why local clubs and municipalities are being asked to maintain and pay the taxes on lands that are owned by the province of Ontario? Or is this yet another Liberal tax grab? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for, for the question. Uh, I always, always greatly appreciate when members are raising issues on, beha on be behalf of important, important constituencies. This is the first I've heard of this, Mr. Speaker, to be very honest with you. It concerns me greatly. I will certainly look into it. Uh, there could be an issue between hydro and safety issues. I can't speculate in detail on what the issue would be. Um, I take the member's uh, concern as sincere, and I will, will, will commit to working with him to resolve this issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister. Minister, the use of hydro corridors is paramount, as you know, to the snowmobile trail system. These new requirements will impact snowmobile clubs across the province and may needlessly lead to the dissolution of an industry that's presently thriving. So to give the Minister an idea of the impact of this new regulation, a cost estimate done in my riding by the Township of Springwater found their share of the cost of the taxes on a mere three kilometres of trail to be $3,700 per year. Remember, there's thousands of kilometres of trail using hydro corridors, and that this is only for three kilometres, and they will also be responsible for the fencing and maintenance. Snowmobile clubs can't afford this, obviously, and municipalities can't afford it. This issue affects thousands of snowmobile clubs, thousands of dealers, thousands of restaurants, hotels, gas stations, and thousands of jobs in rural Ontario. Is your government prepared to create another complete disarray in a thriving industry like the snowmobile Question. industry in Ontario, just like you did in the horse racing industry? Yeah, or will you act now to ensure this doesn't happen? Um, I think, you know, Mr. Speaker, my tone to the member was very constructive and positive, so if we could just sort of park the rhetoric for a moment. We're working very closely with snowmobile clubs right now to look at, to look at integrating uh, our fee systems with Minnesota, uh, Manitoba, and that. We've had a number of concerns raised by snowmobile clubs. As you know, we have a very good agreement that's up for renewal with them, where they maintain trails and we fund them, we collect a fee. I'm quite surprised, Mr. Speaker, given the level of contact we have with these clubs. They have not raised this issue with me. I am very glad they've raised the, uh, the issue with the, with, the, with the minister, uh, with the member opposite, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have a great respect for the member and will look forward to working with them to resolve it. I, I certainly share the concern if those facts are as they say he is, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, Mr. Speaker. I am not satisfied with them. I will work with him to correct the situation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from uh, Trent, uh, Parkdale High Park. Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing. 165,723 people languish on affordable housing waitlists in Toronto alone, an abysmal new record. The uh, City of Toronto, as well as many other municipalities across Ontario, including London, Thunder Bay, expressed support for my inclusionary zoning bill. Even Hazel is supportive. The regional planning commissioners of Ontario, representing planning directors, commissioners, senior officials of municipal governments, also all supported my bill. Inclusionary zoning would provide up to 12,000 new units a year in affordable housing and address the crisis that is plaguing Ontario without, Mr. Speaker, one tax dollar being spent. My inclusionary zoning bill has been introduced four, count them four times, and was referred to committee, but the Liberal government has refused to bring it forward or to act on it. How many more families have to be on the waiting list for this government to act? Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And certainly, we realize that this is a very serious issue. And since 2003, we've invested three billion dollars, the largest affordable housing program ever uh, in the province's history. I want to thank the member for her uh, advocacy on this file. I know that she has the private member's bill on inclusionary zoning. We need. We believe that municipalities are in the best position to understand local needs. That's why we give municipalities some of the tools they need to look at affordable housing options. I know Toronto has been looking at some options in the last week. We're happy to work with them, and I'm happy to work with the member ongoing. Thank here, you, here. Speaker. Thank you. I, uh, <clears throat> I apologize to the member from Parkdale High Park. I have these brain things happen from time to time. Um, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon. Mm -hmm.